real enemy, don't we? We have an enemy. And uh, the sad truth is, is that many of us don't even recognize who the enemy is. We sometimes can get ourselves in a situation where we believe our spouse is the enemy, where we believe our children's the enemy, where we believe the pastor, the church is the enemy. But we have one enemy, and that's the devil. Amen. Satan is wise. He knows how to handle you and I. Oftentimes we allow him to slip in, and the only way the devil can get in our life is if we allow him. We do not fight for victory. We are fighting from victory. As a Christian, the Bible says there's a difference. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. When you and I were born again, when you got saved, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, Christ took up residence in your life. And because He has overcome, we too can overcome. We have the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is Christ that gives us the victory. Uh, and God it is and it is God that is faithful. And yet so many times in our Christian life, it seems like we're scrambling for victory. We're trying to find victory. We're trying to be victorious. But with Christ, we already have the victory. And yet so often we struggle in our Christian life. We struggle because we've allowed the enemy to take up residence. We've allowed the enemy to overcome instead of us being overcomers. Over the next five weeks, starting this week and the four weeks following, I'm going to preach a series of messages on the enemy. I'm going to preach a series of messages on the enemy. And we have one enemy, and that's the devil. I want to be very careful because the Bible says we're neither to give place to the devil. In preaching and teaching on the devil, I don't want the devil to get the glory. I want God to get the glory. But the Bible warns us that we're to be sober, we're to be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan's goal is destruction. He wants to ruin your children. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin your marriage, your home. He wants to ruin the church of the living God. He wants to do everything he can to destroy what God is trying to do. I'm so thankful that as a child of God that there is nothing the devil can do according to the Word of God to hinder my eternity. Satan cannot take away my salvation. Satan cannot remove that which God has given. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Satan is roaming this world to and fro looking for someone to destroy. He and his band of demons are doing everything he can to hinder the work of God, not only as we think about the work of God in the church, but in the life of God's people. Satan cannot hinder my eternity. He cannot change my eternal destination. I cannot lose my salvation because my salvation was never mine to lose. It was given by God. It was never based upon me. It was based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And if you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you're secure in the Father's hand. And the Bible said there's no one, including yourself, that can pluck you out of the Father's hand. We're kept by the Father. So if Satan cannot remove or hinder or change our eternal destination, he will do everything he can to keep us from helping others come to know the Jesus Christ that we know. He's an enemy. The devil is your enemy. The devil has never meant good for anyone. And as we think about the enemy, as we, as we begin to approach this subject, I want to be certain to give God the glory. Because there is nothing that Satan can bring to me that God cannot give me the authority to overcome. Amen. There's nothing the devil can place before me that God cannot give me the authority to overcome. Why? Because I'm a child of God. I'm one of His. I belong to Him. There's nothing that can come into my life. There's no way that Satan can attack my life unless the Lord allows it. God always gives His best to His children. And as we think about the enemy that you and I deal with and face every single day of our life, I would say this to you. The one thing that hinders the work of God in every one of our lives the one thing that hindered the work of Jesus Christ on this earth in His earthly ministry 
is the one thing that allows the devil to often gain footing in our life. And that is unbelief. It's a lack of faith. The Bible says in the New Testament that he, made, he did not many good works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. The disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ, why couldn't we cast out the devil? Why couldn't we take care of this situation? He said, because of your unbelief. He said, because this kind goeth out only by prayer and fasting. Our unbelief, our lack of faith is often what keeps us looking for victory instead of living in victory. I'm going to say that again. Our lack of faith is often what keeps us looking for victory instead of living in victory. We're overcomers. Jesus Christ overcame the devil, death, hell, and the grave at Calvary 2,000 years ago. And because he lives on the inside, I too can overcome. But often our lack of faith, our lack of trust in God, do you know this? That every person that walks the face of this earth has faith. It is not the fact of faith, every one of us possesses faith, that makes us victorious. It is the object of our faith. Every person who lives has faith. But there are many people who place their faith in mankind. There are many people who place their faith in themselves. There are many people who place their faith in their finances, in their jobs, in their surroundings, in their relationships. And we place faith in all kinds of things. But understand, victorious Christian living only comes when we place our full faith in Jesus Christ. The object of our faith has to be the Lord. The object of our focus, Brother Elmer, has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if it is not, then Satan will slip in. The devil will do his work. Satan will work harder than anyone at everything and desire no credit just as long as his will is accomplished. You know, God has a will for your life. And just as God has a will for your life, everything that God does, Satan tries to imitate. Let me say that again. Everything that God does, Satan tries to imitate. You should put that in perspective as you think about your relationship with Jesus Christ and where you serve the Lord and where you go to church. Everything that God does, Satan tries to imitate. And anything that focuses on man is not true worship. Anything that focuses on the ideas and opinions of men is not true worship. Because true worship focuses on one thing, and that is the God of heaven. Every one of us have faith, but what's the object of our faith? Our faith must be Jesus Christ, because if it is not, the devil slips in. And I said just a moment ago, Satan has a will just like God has a will for your life. I can promise you this, the end result of Satan's will for your life is never good. Can I tell you that the Bible teaches us, and we're going we're to read our scripture in just a moment. I'm, I'm, making a, I'm laying a foundation. You know, the Bible tells us, that God's will is that all men be saved? Aren't you glad that God desires for all men to be saved? Not just the elect, not just the few, but that all men be saved. God desires for all men to be saved. Well, if God desires for all men to be saved, Satan's will is that all men die and go to hell. You know what Satan wants for your life? He wants you in hell with him for all of eternity. Satan knows that the end result of his existence or the, the getting off point, so to speak, the stopping off point of his existence is the lake of fire. The Bible says that one day he's going to be bound and cast into the lake of fire. Aren't you thankful for that? He's roaming to and fro today and we know it. But one day he's going to be bound and cast into the lake of fire. The Bible also says that those whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were also bound and cast in the lake of fire. You know what Satan wants? He wants you there with him. He wants you to spend eternity separated from God forever. That's his will. But when we come to know the Lord, Satan cannot do anything about our eternity. But he can impact our life on earth. What we do for God. We have a real enemy. 
And sad to say, to be honest with you, the enemy is gaining ground. More homes are now, we have more homes that are uh, dealing with struggles and issues that God never intended for the home to deal with. We have more young people that are going off to the things of the world than we do that are trying to serve God. We have churches that are diverting from the truth and perverting their ministry with the opinions and ideas of men. You say, well, that's just the way it is. No, it's the devil's gaining ground. And God's people are to be aware. We have a real enemy. You know, there were four people in the Old Testament that had an encounter with Satan. There were four people in the Old Testament that had an encounter with Satan. Eve, Job, David, and Joshua. God gives us over the next four weeks, we're going to study those four people and ask God to help us to be aware of the tactics of Satan. But the Bible says here the beginning, the foundation that all of us must possess if we're going to be victorious over the devil is faith. We have to be willing to trust God. You know, the biggest battle that we face in all of our lives is the battle that we face just lacking faith in what God said. We're disobedient because we lack faith. We're disobedient oftentimes because the same reason that your kids go home and you tell them, hey, if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. And we often neglect to deal with the issue or deal with the responsibility that we have as a parent and, and, and our children just kind of go on. The same thing applies in our life as a Christian. We just don't believe that God's word is true. So we'll just live and do anything that we want to until the emergency room comes. And all of a sudden we need God. You know, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Faith is not something we pray for and receive at the moment of salvation, and that is it. Faith is something, Brother Elmer, we're to live day by day, moment by moment, in complete dependence and trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we do not, the Bible says without faith we can't please the Lord, and without faith we don't have the strength to overcome. So we must possess faith. We must be people of faith. And faith is much more easy to speak about and to teach about than it is to live. We must be people of faith. Why is that so important? Because if we're going to overcome the enemy, our complete trust has to be in God. If we're going to overcome the enemy, our complete trust has to be in the Lord. I want to show you someone in the Old Testament this morning. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter number 12. Genesis, chapter number 12, and we'll find a man here by the name of Abram. The Bible says in Genesis, chapter number 12, we're going to turn a few chapters here in Genesis, so find your place there, hold your place there, because I want you to be able to go with me, please. The Bible says in Genesis, chapter number 12, we know the story, and you've heard it over and over again, but I want to read through this and show you just a few things, to point out just a few things to you. That can help you. Genesis chapter number 12. Before we read this morning, let's ask God to help us. Lord, we do love you today. And God, I need you in this moment. I know the devil is at work. God, I believe that you desire to work. Lord, would you please take and use this sermon, use this message, use these next few moments to bring honor and glory to yourself. And God, I pray that you would bless this service. I pray, God, that you wouldn't allow any distraction, but that, God, you would work in the hearts and lives of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say to you, I believe this is important because so many of us struggle in this area. Some of you sitting in this room this morning, the devil has the victory in your life in certain areas. There are areas that you struggle in. There are areas we all struggle in, but maybe the, the devil has the victory in your thought life. Maybe the devil has the victory with your mouth, the things that you talk about, the people you talk about, the things that you say. Maybe in your attitude, maybe in just a rebellious spirit, the devil has the victory. Can I tell you, the devil will never let up. And if we don't learn to combat, if we don't learn to fight the devil and be overcomers through the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Sad to say, we're going to become nothing more than statistics that are used for the next generation. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number 12, that there was a man by the name of Abram. Verse number 1, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And if you mark things in your Bible, I want you to mark this. And I will make of thee a great nation. Who is the I there? The Lord. Who is the thee there? Abram. God said, I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Stop for just a moment, commercial time. This is why we stand with Israel. This is why we, you say, Pastor Brian, that's not a big deal. No, God promised in His Word, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. By the way, do you think it's, do you think it's just happenstance that Russia and China have gathered together for the largest war games in the history of mankind? Who do you think they're getting ready to fight? God, God said, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Israel has been and will always be God's chosen people. And God's people are to learn to stand with God's people. The Bible says in verse number 7, though, skip down. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. If you look back in the verse, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto, what are the next two words? Thy seed will I give this land. And there built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. It would do good for us to build some altars and make some memorials of the promises of God in our life. To remind ourselves often of the goodness of the Lord. So in these two verses that we've read so far, and we're going to continue reading, God has promised Abraham, I'm going to bless you with children. That's what he means in verse number uh, 2. I will make of thee a great nation. Verse number 7, he he says specifically, Unto thy seed will I give this land. God has promised Abraham children. God says, I will give thee. I will give thee. Turn with me, if you would, please, over a few chapters to chapter number 15. Where the Bible says in verse number 1, it says, And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Aren't you glad that God is our shield? Amen. Hey, I'm, one day I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to enjoy the reward that God has blessed me with. I'm going to, the Bible says, I have not seen, ear had not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God hath prepared for them that love him. One day I'm going to get to see heaven. It'll be amazing. But God says also that I'm not only your reward, I'm your shield. I'm your protector, he says in verse number 2. And Abraham said, Lord, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, thou hast given me no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Abraham says, I have no child. What did God promise him in chapter 12? He said, I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you a child. I'm going to bless you. And said, through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He says, I'm going to bless you. God says, I've got a promise for you. Remember what I said any time that God desires to work, so does the devil. And in the very next chapter, guess who comes calling? Satan. I find here and I read here about a godly man by the name of Abraham. And if you don't think that Abraham had faith, you go to Hebrews chapter 11 and you read it. Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham would be what we call today a strong Christian. He was a man of faith that was used of God mighty, I believe. But no one is immune to the attacks of the devil. 
No family is immune to the attacks of Satan. No home is immune to the attacks of Satan. I don't care how often you come to church. I don't care how often you read your Bible. I don't care how often you do the things that you're supposed to do. I promise you, friend, there will come a day if you decide you're going to live for God that Satan will come knocking on your door. And here he comes. Now, God has already promised thee that I'm going to bless thee. I'm going to give thee a child. And here's verse number 1 of chapter 16. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my handmaid. It may be that I obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband Abraham to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah, I said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my handmaid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, the Lord judge between me and thee. And Abraham said unto Sarah, I behold, thy maid is thy hand, as in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled. From her face. Skip down if you would please. Verse number 15. And Hagar bare Abraham a son. And Abraham called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was four score and six years old. And Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. I said to you just a moment ago that if we are going to overcome the devil, we're going to have to be people of faith. People that trust the Lord. Can I say to you, there is no substitute for God's Word. There is no substitute to surrender to God's will. And every one of us are going to give an account of the life that we live today, in this moment. By the way, the will of God is always present. It's not, I'm going to be in the will of God tomorrow, or I was in the will of God yesterday, but am I in the will of God today? The will of God is always present. Brother Craig, turn the fans on, please. The will of God is always present. Am I in the will of God now? Am I in the will of God at this moment? And when we think about the enemy that comes for us, the enemy that's after us, and our ability to exercise faith, it is going to take great faith to just simply trust the Lord. We battle this every moment of our life because the devil is pulling at us, Satan is pulling at us, our flesh the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life is pulling us in the wrong direction. And, and when we choose to sin, even that little white sin that we believe is no big deal, that simple sin that's not that important, we give in and lack faith in Christ and trust our faith in the flesh. You follow me? You understand where I'm at there? The little things in our life that have become so normal because we've accepted the fact, Brother Elmer, we're not as bad as the world. We don't do all these things. And yet we wonder why the devil has more victory than we do. I haven't reached this point. I haven't arrived at this. I'm not that bad. I mean, look at our family. It's not like this family. Look at our marriage. It's not like this marriage. Look at my life. It's not as bad as theirs. We go so filled with pride and faith in our flesh that we, the more faith, Brother Elmer, we possess in our flesh, and in ourself, the weaker we become spiritually, and Satan gains the victory. Every moment must be surrendered to the Lord. And the Bible says here that Abram gets weak because God had made a promise that I'm going to bless thee. That I'm going to bless thee. You say, Pastor Brian, I want to live by faith. Can I say to you, I, I often preach and I desire to live by faith, but practically... I don't always do it. Can you, can you see here that the Bible says, that God says to Abraham, Abraham, 
You're going to have to exercise faith. I'm going to give you a child, and through him all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He said that this land will belong to you. And Abraham, I believe, desired to have faith, but practically in this moment Abraham didn't exercise it. Can I tell you that positionally I have faith in God? For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. I said it just a moment ago. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is in me. But practically, we do not live by faith. Practically, we don't operate trusting God. And Abraham arrives at this moment in his life, and we say, well, I want to live by faith. I want God to help me live by faith. Because in living by faith, I'm trusting God. And in trusting God is that safest place from the attack of the devil that's the safest place when it comes to the enemy is right where God wants me to be I'm going to trust the Lord the Bible says here that God gives us in this passage of scripture four ways to test our faith when I say test our faith I'm not talking about our faith being tried I'm talking about you and I sitting down and testing our faith. Am I living by faith? Because until we as God's people learn to live by faith, we will never overcome what Satan is doing in our life. Let me say that again. Until we as God's people learn to live by faith, we will never overcome those areas that we're struggling in. We'll never overcome those areas our marriages are failing in. We will never overcome those areas in our life that we're secretly struggling in. We will never come overcome our thought life. And we will never overcome the issues in our home until we learn to simply trust God and follow Him. Four ways to test your faith. Am I living by faith? If I ask you today, how many of you want to be people of faith? As a matter of fact, let's ask the question. How many of you want to be people of faith? Would you raise your hand? Just about every hand in here is raised. So let's ask ourselves, are we living by faith? Do the things in our life line up with what we say we want for our life? No one says, I want to have a terrible marriage. No one says, I want to have kids that are rebellious. No one says, I want to have a life that's just chewed up and spit out by the devil, that's filled with scars and struggles. No one ever woke up and said, hey, that's the kind of life that I want to live. But just because we don't want that doesn't mean that's going to be the case. We have to exercise faith in the Lord. Because the devil is roaming to and fro. He's he's walking to and fro about the earth, seeking whom he may devour. And friend, we can take one wrong step in the wrong direction and it'd be detrimental to our spiritual health. We can make one wrong decision and every decision has ripple effects. Every choice has a consequence. We can move one wrong way. I've always said to folks, don't ever leave the place of God's blessing in your life. Don't ever leave the place of God's blessing. Listen, you don't need man's blessing. You need God's blessing. There are principles that God gives us in His Word that says if you do these, I'll bless you. I'll give you what you need. I'll take care of you. But if you get away from those, you can't expect God to bless. Don't ever leave the place of God's blessing. And Abraham arrives at this moment and and he's going to give us some things for us as Christians to say, hey, am I living by faith? Am I living by faith? I want to give you the first thing, if you would please take a pen and write it down. You have a place to take notes there. Look back with me, if you would please, in verse number 1 of chapter 15. Verse number 1 of chapter 15. Actually, I'm sorry, verse number 1 of chapter 12. Verse number 2 in chapter 12 says, and, and or verse number 1, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that, what's the next word there? I. I. Who, is, who is that I referring to? God, the Lord, right? Look in verse number 2. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, that thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and Curse them that curse thee, and shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The Lord says to them, I will bless, I will show, I will make, 
I will bless, I will bless, verse number 7, he says, and I give this land. You know what God is saying there? The first thing you have to ask yourself as we contemplate testing our faith is this. When we make the decisions of our life, when we make the choices in our life, the first thing that we have to contemplate is this, is does this give God the glory? Does this give glory to God? You say, Pastor Brian, I want to be a person of faith. The first question you have to ask yourself is this, is does this give glory to God? The Bible says in chapter number 16 of the passage that we just read in Genesis, it said, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now, get this, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. The Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Does this give glory to God? Too many times in our life, we're more concerned about getting the glory ourselves than God having the glory. That doesn't do much for our ego, but it is very much reality. You turn the news on. You turn the news on. I, I don't think we ought to ever uh, choose to make fun of somebody else's struggles. But I, I saw this weekend, and my wife showed me this weekend, some of the reporting that was done on the hurricane that hit in North Carolina. It's amazing the extremes that people will go to for self-gratification. It's amazing the extremes that people will go to to say, hey, look at me and look what I'm doing and look how I've arrived and look what I'm accomplishing, even if it means deceit. Can I tell you that exaggeration and deceitfulness is lying? Well, it's just a little exaggeration. It's just a little issue. It's just a little thing. No, it's a lie. And the Bible says, you know what the Bible says about liars? You better be very careful about those little things you think, well, it's just a, just a comment, it's just a word, it's just a thing, it's just who I am. No, it's a lie. The Bible says that the glory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did the Bible say in John chapter number 15, he said, we read it on Wednesday evening, he said, Lord... He said, Father, glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Understand something. It is never God's will for you to bring glory to yourself. The Bible says that Christ will exalt. He says the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It is Christ that will exalt. It is never God's will for God's people to glorify themselves. It is only God's will for God's people to glorify Him. And when Abraham and Sarah had a different plan besides what God's plan was, what they were doing is they were robbing God of His glory. They were robbing God of His glory. Now, I, I, I wish often that I could preach every message was a shout out, hallelujah, Thank you, Jesus. Good time message. But this message here is a message that is right where you and I are. Because we are too busy worried about self that God has been placed on the back burner. And you know as well as I do, sir, you know as well as I do, ma'am, that in the quiet, secret places of your heart, you are failing miserably against the attacks of the devil because you're bringing glory to yourself rather than having a lie that is glorifying to God. God said to Abraham, I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And I will bless thee. And I will give unto thee. And all of a sudden Abraham says, well, God, I got a plan to help you out. Mark her down. God doesn't need our help. Before we get too big and think we're too important, friend, God said, if you won't praise me, the rocks will cry out. You ever seen a rock? You know what it does? It sits there and does absolutely nothing. And God says, I can make that praise me. God doesn't need you and me, but He desires to use us. That doesn't do much for our ego, does it? God doesn't need our help. God just needs us to be to surrender to His will. 
Does it bring glory to God? Am I glorifying the Lord? I'm going to make a decision, and I'm going to, I'm going to live by faith. So before I make this decision, and, and because I want to be a person of faith, let me ask myself question one. Does this bring glory to God? Does God get the glory? Does God get the glory for my spirit? Does God get the glory for my conversation? Does God get the glory for my actions? Does God get the glory for my service? Does God get the glory for my sacrifice? Does God get the glory? Because if he doesn't, that's not faith. Secondly, the second question. Look what the Bible says, if you would please, in verse number 1. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him, of 16, bare him, no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Stop for just a moment. God had not restrained Sarah from, bear, from bearing. Because in, you'll find in just a few chapters, she was about to have a baby. God hadn't restrained her. It's amazing sometimes what we claim is the will of God that God has nothing to do with. It wasn't that God had restrained her from bearing. It was that it wasn't God's timing. The second question I have to ask myself is, number one, does this bring glory to God? The second question I have to ask myself is this, am I in God's will? Somebody says, well, I want to be a person of faith and I want God to lead me in the decisions of life. For instance, I hear this, I see this all the time. We see it play out all the time. There are folks who, who come in and they're struggling. And I'm so glad that God can help us that are struggling, right? I'm so glad that God cares for those that are down and out. Amen. I've been down and out. I've been, I've been low and I've been uh, discouraged and God has picked me up and I'm thankful for that. But oftentimes we come in and we think we found the solution. Here's the solution, Abraham. We'll just, we'll just figure it out for God. We'll figure it out for God. Here's the solution, Abraham. Here's the solution. You know, our life has been a wreck and our, our home is a ruined. And, and here's what we're going to do. Here's what we think the next thing that is going to help us. If we move here, it'll all be fine. If we possess this home, it'll all be fine. If we can save this amount of money, everything will go away. And they believe that that one decision is going to help them Find God's will. Understand something. You will never find God's will. You will never find God's will about tomorrow until you learn to live in God's will today. You will never find God's will about tomorrow until you learn to live in God's will today. Don't expect to run into the emergency room of life and get on your knees and say, God, I want your will when our life does not back up what we say we believe. Am I in God's will? You know the problem here was? Abraham and Sarah got themselves in a situation where they were out of God's will. What does he say in chapter 15? Look, he says, And after these things, verse number 1, The word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield. He says, I am the protector. And he says, And I am thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? Verse number 3, And Abraham said, Behold, to me is given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And the, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir. God has promised Abraham in chapter 15, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to bless you. He said, here's what God says to him. As a matter of fact, look, if you would please. Verse number 2. And Abraham said unto the Lord God, What wilt? Thou give me. In other words, God said, the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, what is your will? Lord, what are you going to will me? What are you going to give me, uh, seeing that I have no child? And here's what the word of the Lord said. This shall not be thine heir, but he that come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Verse number five. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. God said, here's my will. I'm going to give you a son. And in chapter 16, Brother Elmer, Abraham and Sarah are already out of God's will. You know what that tells me? Even the strongest of Christians have to be reminded daily to be surrendered to God's will. Why? Because if we're not in God's will, guess what we're doing? We're opening ourselves up to the devil. We're opening ourselves up to let the deceiver, the liar, the accuser, slip in and the goal is destruction 
Is this God's will? Am I in God's will? Not just for tomorrow. I'm planning to be in God's will. I'm going to get it right later. I will soon. I'll take care of it. God says, no, no, not then are you in God's will now. You wonder why you're struggling. I have good intentions. I have good desires. What about reality? What about now? Are you in God's will? Because if you're arguing with God now, you'll argue with Him tomorrow. And that thing that you think is going to bring you fulfillment will be nothing but a battle for the rest of your life. Am I in God's will? The third thing, the third question to ask yourself. Number one, we see, does this bring glory to God? God was the one that promised Abraham. Secondly, we ask ourselves, am I in the will of God? What did Abraham and Sarah do? They got, they got ahead of God. They got ahead of the Lord. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, the Bible says that Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. In the very first verse of chapter 17, it says that when Abraham was 90, four years later, God comes to Abraham. He said, here's what's going to happen. He says, Abraham, I'm going to tell you what my plan is. Four years later, God shows up and he says, Abraham, you're going to bear a son whose name's Isaac. And I, I will, and God shows grace and he says, I will multiply the seed of Ishmael, but I'm going to bless Isaac. He doesn't bless Ishmael. He says, I'll multiply him. He says, but I'm going to bless Isaac. I think it's interesting that God uses the same terminology as he speaks of Isaac that he used with Abraham in chapter 12 when he initially made the promise. He said, I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to bless your seed. And then he says, I'm going to bless Isaac. What they do, they got ahead of God. We're, our, our job is not to be ahead of the Lord and our job is not to lag behind. Our job is to be right where God wants us to be. The third question. Not only does this bring glory to God and am I in God's will, but number three. I want to be a person of faith, so I have to ask myself this question. Does this agree with God's word? Does this agree with God's word? You've heard it said over and over again. God will never, and I can say never, on the authority of God's word, God will never lead you to do something that contradicts his word. Let me make the Christian life very simple. Follow this book and you'll be all right. That's the Christian life in simplicity. We don't need to add anything to it. I'm thankful for good books that we can read. I'm thankful for people who have wisdom that can pass it along. I'm thankful for encouragement that we find. But understand something. There's nothing that needs to be added to this for us to be successful. The third question that we have to ask is, does this agree with the Word of God? I want you to notice something. Look in, if you would please, in chapter 12. We're going to go back to chapter 16, but I want you to look in chapter 12. The Bible says in verse number 1, And the Lord had said unto Abraham. Verse number 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham. Go back to chapter 15. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham. Verse number 4, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. As a matter of fact, if you study chapter 12 through chapter 22 and you see the number of times that God came to Abraham, including chapter 17, verse number 1, where the Lord said, I'm going to promise you, I make this promise to you. See the number of times that God came to speak to Abraham. But there's a difference in chapter 16. Verse number 1, what does it say? And Sarah, Abraham's wife, said unto Abraham, you see, there are a lot of good people that God brings in our life that I'm very thankful for. But there is no substitute for God in your life. You see, this whole time Abraham had been listening to the voice of God and then all of a sudden Sarah became the voice he listened to. We struggle so often in our marriages and we struggle so often in our churches because we're trying to battle over who's going to be God in our life. Can I tell you, I, my wife and I have been married 20 years. Every marriage that works together has friction. How many of you have ever warmed up your hands? 
How do you do that? By friction. When we got married, we got married, and I was 20 years old when I got married. I'm not recommending that to anybody, especially my daughter. <laughs> I was 20 years old when I got married. I won't tell you how old my wife was. She came from a different part of the country than I did. I will say this. She's been gloriously saved by the grace of God, <laughs> transplanted. She's lived in the south now longer than she ever lived in the north. God is good. Amen. But we came from different places. And the Bible says when we got married that we became one flesh. It wasn't 50% on her side and 50% on my side. And by the way, as long as you're trying to measure who's giving the most, that usually means you haven't given everything either. Stop trying to measure how much you give and how much he gives or how much she gives and how much you give and understand that God commands us all to give everything. We become one flesh. And whether it's a half of a percent, just that one little bit can create struggles. Every marriage requires work. If you thought you were going to get married and everything was going to be easy, you're ignorant to what marriage is. You have to work at it. You have to compromise. We work together. And a godly wife is a, is a wife that will let her husband lead. I better hit that one again. A, God, a godly wife is a wife that will let her husband lead. But a godly husband is one that recognizes the magnitude of that responsibility. I'm not a boss. I'm not a dictator. I'm a leader. And by the way, if nobody's following me, I'm not a leader. Someone said to me one time, they said, Brother Brian, you're a leader. You're, you're to be a leader. But if you're leading and no one's following, you're just on a long walk by yourself, man. We don't lead through rules. We lead through love. That's how God leads. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. When God loved us, we didn't love Him. Because of the love, there are guidelines and there, there, there are roadmaps to help us accomplish. But me and her are in this thing together. Hey, if she fails, I fail. If I fail, she fails. If I succeed, we succeed. It's not, it's not, well, you've done this and you've done this. No, what have we done? We don't struggle in our homes because this person did this, because this person did this. We struggle in our home because we get out of the place God wants us. Abraham and Sarah struggled. Listen, do you understand that the child that came as a result of this relationship caused and it's continuing to cause struggle. Think about that for just a moment. All the way back in Genesis, a husband and wife got out of God's will. And the entire world today is impacted because of that decision. Does it line up with the word of God? Let me simplify the Christian life for you. Is it God's will? Am I glorifying God? How, how can we know that? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? I'm going to be a person of faith, so I'm just going to follow this book. I'm just going to follow this book. I'm thankful the thing that I learned. People say, what did you learn most from your dad? The thing that I learned most from my dad is faithfulness. He did what he was supposed to do day in and day out, just over and over and over again. Everybody has their issues. Everybody has their problems. But my dad did what he was supposed to do over and over and over again. You know what he did? He just lived by that book. Amen. He was faithful. He said, this decision I'm going to make, is it okay by the word of God? Then the last thing will be done. Everybody still with me? Yes. I'm going to test my faith. So what happens? Abraham goes into Sarah. Or Abraham goes to Hagar. Look what the Bible says in verse number 2 of 16. And Sarah said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maid. It may be, with, it may be that I may obtain a child by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. There he is again, not God's voice, but Sarah's voice. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid. Listen, watch what happens here. 
the Egyptian. And after Abram had dwelt, dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her husband Abraham to be his wife. God, uh, the Bible says that Sarah, not in God's plan, but in her own plan and Abraham's plan. By the, hand, by, the, by, the, by the way, Abraham was just as much as responsible as Sarah was. The Bible says that Abraham's wife Sarah gave Abraham, look at the wording please, to be his wife. Hagar, I want Hagar to be your wife. Look in verse number 4. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, guess what? Now it's no longer wife, is it? What's she call her in verse number 4? His mistress. His mistress was despised in her eyes. You know, what, you know what I learned there? That as a child of God, the moment we do wrong, we know it's not right. Nobody has to tell you as a child of God you're doing wrong. You know it. Nobody has to tell you there's something you need to get right in your life. You know it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit does His job every time. Right. Nobody has to tell you to get it right. Nobody has to tell you it's not right. Nobody has to tell you you shouldn't have or that was the worst thing you could have done or don't do that again. Nobody has to tell you because the moment you do it, you realize it's not the will of God. The Bible says her mistress despised. Gets, get, look, it doesn't get any better. And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. Guess what happens? Sarah not only gets mad... And Sarah said to Abraham, hey, Abraham, I got a good idea. Why don't you just go have a baby with Hagar? That'd be great. Do that. The Bible says she conceives, and guess what happens? Sarah changes her mind. You're no longer his wife, you're his mistress. And guess what, Abraham? It's your fault. That's what she says. Look what he says. My wrong be upon thee. My wrong, Sarah says, be upon thee, Abraham. I have given my maid to thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Get this, the Lord judge between me and thee. Now Sarah's trying to bring God into it. You say, what's happening here? The fourth thing you have to ask yourself, and when you say, am I a person of faith, when I'm testing my faith, is does this bring glory to God? Am I in God's will? Does this agree with the Word of God? Then the third thing, do I have joy and peace? Wait a minute, Pastor Brian, I've had to do some things as a Christian that I wasn't really happy about. I had to do some things that, I had, to, I had to go through some things that, it wasn't really a joyful time. The reason we had to, the reason we felt that way is because we don't understand that in the will of God there's peace. In the will of God there's great joy. That your joy, knowing this at the trying of your faith, work of patience. What does he say later on in the same passage? He says, what about our joy? That your joy, that you might have joy. Listen, there's, if we have to suffer, if we suffer for God, it ought to bring us great joy. If we have to go through a hard time as long as God gets the glory, our lives are just vessels God can use, it ought to bring us joy. It ought to bring us peace. Was there peace in Abraham's home here? Was there peace? That stinking mistress. Here, Abraham, I have a wife for you. Sorry, mistress. This is your fault, Abraham. God, you judge. Look at all this that's going on. Was there peace? By the way, there still hasn't been peace as a result of this, this decision. There's no peace. Look, what's Hagar do? Here's Hagar. She leaves, runs, because she's scared Abraham's Abraham is going to kill her because Sarah is mad. By the way, stop for just a moment. Pause. Sir, you need to be very careful. We need to be very careful as men being the examples that comes to our wives. Men are made as protectors. But we better be careful not to respond emotionally. We better be careful not to respond emotionally. Emotions are good. But you can't respond emotionally. You have to respond according to the will of God. The Bible says Hagar leaves because Abraham's upset. Sarah's got him all wound up. Look in verse number 15. And Hagar bare Abraham a son and called his name. Son of Hagar, uh, Hagar bare him Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old. Do I have peace? Do I have joy? 
Why? Because God desires as a, a, for us as children of God, God desires that you and I, to, for us to serve Him, we're to serve Him with joy. He told us in, in John chapter number 5, He said that your joy might be full, that your joy might remain. He tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength. Great peace have they which love thy law. What is thy law? The word of God. And nothing shall offend them. You see, when you talk about faith and living by faith, you have to ask yourself, does this bring glory to God? Is what I'm doing bringing glory to God? Am I in God's will? Does it line up with God's word? And the product of that is peace and joy in our life. Are we happy in the Lord? God's people should be the most happiest people on the face of this earth. And yet we're walking around like we're, like we're miserable. Why? I can tell you why. Because the devil is winning too many battles in our life. Because the focus has not become, the focus has become everything else other than Christ. And we're struggling. In this life, ye shall have persecution. You'll have tribulation. But what does he tell us? But be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Be a person of faith. Be grounded. Why? Because the enemy's waiting. He's coming for you. I promise you he's coming. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Be a person of faith. Am I in God's will? Am I glorifying God? Am I lined up with God's word? Do I have peace and joy in my life? I'm just miserable. I'm just miserable. There's only one of two things. If you're miserable, there's only one of two things. Number one, you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. So I don't know the Lord as my Savior. You say, Pastor Brian, I don't know if I believe that. Well, if it's not that you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then it's you're out of the will of God. Because the will of God settles everything in our life. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, we love you this morning. God, I do thank you for your word that is true. I do thank you for your...